That's the last time. I'm not sure I'm done with the time. Am I right? Yeah. No, I should put it closer. I don't know if it will reach. I don't know. So let's see. You might just change it over here. Thank <laughs> you. 
Sham, Mother Sham, come on in. You, you're okay over there? Okay, how you go? Nice to see you. Welcome. You too. Go very well. Hi, Oh my God, come on down, Sam. Try to avoid. <laughs> so yeah, many 
persons who actually are in spiritual circles who know Shri Prabhupada, at least heard of them, or even devotees, don't really understand his actual position within the world and within this particular historical time period. And there's a beautiful statement from the Brahmanda Purana, Purana, Brahmanda Purana, where it says that. And this is Krishna speaking. Krishna speaking to Gunga Devi, the personification of the Ganges River. And he, he, he says to Ganges, he said, in 5,000 years, there will be a personality he will come. He will be my mantra upasana. And he will take my holy name everywhere around the world. So that, was, that statement was made 5,000 years. Years ago, when Krishna spoke this statement to Gandhadevi. So you can hear, you can understand from this statement that Srila Prabhupada's appearance in the world was not some arrangement by the material energy, or that he became a great soul simply by his austerities and penances and his knowledge of Shastra. Actually, Srila Prabhupada was predicted to come at this particular time. And it's a beautiful statement, it's actually coming from Srila Prabhupada himself. Sometimes Srila Prabhupada would speak about himself um, just without any connection to anything. He would just start speaking to his devotees. And there was one particular situation where one devotee was in the Kaiser. It wasn't uh, Sruti Kirti, it was actually Bhagavananda. And he, Prabhupada started to speak in a very mysterious way, kind of a mystical way. And Prabhupada said, I was with Krishna in the spiritual world. And Krishna told me, go to the material world and spread my message. And I said, material world. <laughs> material world. Horrible. Horrible. And then Krishna said to me, no, you go and you write some books and I'll protect you. So I can, Krishna wanted me to come. And of course, even within the more recent time period, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu speaks to Sri Narada Muni and also says, the Lord, you're my Sanatana Bhakta. You will appear on this earth and take the glories of my holy name everywhere, everywhere, to all corners of the world. So Mahaprabhu also made the same prediction to Krishna. And then again, the third and the final one was by Srila Bhakti Thakur. Around the beginning of the, during the end of the 1800s, when he was looking, he was at Mayapur area, looking towards the area where Lord Chaitanya had appeared, his, they call Yoga Peak, the birthplace. And he saw a vision, it wasn't a dream, it was actually a, a mystical vision. And he, see, he saw people from the black race, from the brown race, from the yellow race, from the white race, and from the red race, all dancing together, singing Jai Sachi Mangana. Jai Satchimandana, Jai Satchimandana. And that was really something that really astounded him. And then he could understand by his deep meditation that, yes, this great soul will soon come and take Lord Chaitanya's mission around the world. In 1896, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur had just finished writing a book called The Teachings and Precepts of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it's a small book, so you can find it. It's about maybe a hundred pages. It's not a big book or something. And um, he took that book and made a few copies, many, actually many copies, and sent it to many universities around the world just as a gift for their libraries. One of them wound up in McGill University in Canada. And when devotees in ISKCON were doing the library party, such as Maharaj and Bhakti Tirtha Swami and others, they had come across
lost that book in the Jung University. And they showed it to Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada became really excited. He understood that this was what Bhakti Vinod Thakur had said. And it's interesting, that book went around the world in the same year that Srila Prabhupada was born, 1896. So it was kind of prophetic, saying that the person who would spread the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the and the teachings of Saint Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went around the world at that time when the person who appeared. So this is a little bit about uh, the introduction of Srila Prabhupada's life prior to that. So we should understand that this Srila Prabhupada is a very, he's a Nikhil Siddha. He comes from the spiritual world to do the work of the Lord. When he's finished, he goes back and returns to the spiritual world. Uh, the living entity in the material world comes by the by the connection of the material energy known as the activities of the three modes of material nature. That is our karma. We perform a particular activity and we get a particular results in that activity. And based on the desire of the activity and the results, it perpetuates itself and we build up what is called karma. And by our karma, we, we push ourselves in a certain direction. And at the end of a particular life, that karma is our ticket to our next birth. It describes everything about where we're going and whose child will be, everything. And we take birth again. So, Niche Maya the Vasa, Kachu Vese, Kachu Hubu Hubu, Ajiv Krishna Dasa, Vishwash. So, a living entity in the material world is going from place to place, karna, from the sun goes so, so the sun joins the jungle. So, from the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest planet, we take birth in different species of life, sometimes as a demigod, sometimes as a human, sometimes as another form of life. And this goes on perpetually until one finally gets tired and says, what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? Why do I have to die? Why do I have to go old? Why do I have to be sick? What is, what is everything about? And you'll see that people have been philosophizing for that since time immemorial. If you study the different categories of philosophers, everyone has a, an idea of what life is about and how to live life and how to achieve happiness in life. But everything is basically based on trying to manipulate and re rearrange the material energy to suit one's desire for happiness. But you can't do that because material energy is Krishna's energy and he controls it. He is the person who makes the material energy work the way it does. And so everyone is controlled by the material energy that everyone is trying to control the material energy. So what does that light up? That people life after life just keep sojourning in one situation or another. But when we come in contact with a bona fide spiritual master, then this, this hard struggle to find happiness in the material world can start to come to an end. And one can understand what actually what is the real purpose of life and how to achieve it. And so therefore, without the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master, that sojourn in the material world will continue a life after life after life. So Srila Prabhupada came at a time when there was a lot of social unrest. There was a lot of people looking towards new ways to live life that were different than what they had been brought up they had been Old was the values of life. I can remember also, I was thinking when I was a kid, oh my God, I gotta go to school and I gotta grow up. And my parents, all, all, of, all of the, the grown-ups look miserable. <laughs> and I was thinking, and then I gotta get a, and I have to get a degree, I have to go to school. And then I have to graduate, and then I have to find a girl, and then I have to get married, and then I have to get work to get a house, and have a nice dog to protect the house. <laughs> so I was thinking, oh my God, let me just rewind this whole program and start, start somewhere else. <laughs> so 
so when I looked at you know what was going on in the material world as a way of life, and everybody was thinking, what the fuck is that? I just got to college. I was thinking it must be something different. Fortunately, Sheila Prabhupada came along and he said there is something different and it's actually better. It's the it's it's actually coming in contact with that with that person who is the source of all happiness, the source of all success in life, Krishna. Well, that mercy came at a time when so many persons like myself and others at that time were really just looking for something different, something better. Mostly it was about something different. We didn't know what was better. <laughs> we just needed to change from what we were doing. It didn't matter which, what, what, where we were changing into, just long we change. <laughs> but then again, after changing for a while, we realized we have to find something better also instead of just changing. And that was Prabhupada. He came along and he said, Krishna is your best friend. <laughs> Krishna is the, every, he see, Prabhupada would say, everyone is looking for happiness. Everyone is looking. Krishna represents the principle of ultimate happiness. Not only ultimate happiness, but eternal ultimate happiness, and happiness that never ends. So Prabhupada came along and he was giving the gift of the spiritual world to him. And there were so many yogis and there were so many so-called sadhus at the time that were teaching various things. You know. And most of it was just more or less, I remember we had was it? it was like transcendental meditation. You, you go and you meet this. You didn't meet the yogi. You met one of his representatives. And you paid $35. That's what the price was then. Now it's like a couple thousand. And it gives you a mantra. And then you chant the mantra. And it's like, happy. Happy. You can be. God, <laughs> you can be anything you want. <laughs> so I tried it. And then when I met the devotees, I just changed my mantra. <laughs> I thought it was much better. I was cheating. <laughs> but it was okay because I was being cheated in the first place. But this is the, this is the, the, the times of the 60s, the late 50s, the 60s, and then to the, into the 70s. The 60s were a, a rip-roaring time in, in, in America, especially, where so many things were going on, looking for Prabhupada came right at the right time. And when someone asked Srila Prabhupada, why didn't you come earlier? Prabhupada okay, said, you weren't ready. <laughs> Really, we, were, we came at the time when we were ready to accept that. So we were looking, many people were looking towards Eastern spirituality as some way to find some happiness and success in life. So it became kind of like a fad to go in that direction. The problem had something different. Prabhupada was a lot different. And when Prabhupada started his mission in New York, you know, some of the people from off the streets were coming. And they were still doing their regular, you know, different kinds of yoga. And, you know, Kundalini yoga, and this yoga, and that yoga, and this meditation, that meditation. And they were coming, Prabhupada was having programs with them, and he probably was giving the Hare Krishna mantra, but they were still attached to their, their ways of doing things. So one time, Prabhupada was in his room, and some of the young people were in another room, and they were all doing their thing. And one man who had been heard about that session that night, so he came, so he came up, and he, because he understood Prabhupada was known as Swamiji, Swamiji. So he said, Swamiji, what are all these people doing? And Prabhupada said, I don't know. <laughs> They're not doing what I'm telling them to do. <laughs> so this is what Prabhupada had to go through. Yeah, he to really Prabhupada said, I came to America looking for first class men. 
and I couldn't find any first class. And I was looking, well, maybe second class, but there was none of them either. <laughs> and then all I got was third and fourth class. But then he said there was one first class, and that was nice. He said, that later, that person later became Sula Prabhupada Swami. Probably he met Prabhupada early. Prabhupada could understand he was he was a veteran. So he was going, he was a biological student, chemical biology in, in, in California, came to see Prabhupada. And he was one of the first, so Prabhupada really felt well for me. At least Krishna sent me one person. <laughs> But you know, Prabhupada had to train us, and he didn't really, you know, he was real. Prabhupada was trying to preach Krishna consciousness, but he was also still writing books, at the same time trying to, to engage us into Krishna consciousness. It was very difficult, because we didn't know what we were doing. You know, our motto was, do not turn out, turn out, do not turn in and drop out. <laughs> But Prabhupada changed it around to turn on, tune in, and stay high forever. <laughs> Never come down, Shin Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada took the Maha Mantra as the ultimate high. <laughs> and it worked. The bodies were gradually giving up the substances and taking the Shiva Prabhupada. But still, it was very difficult with Prabhupada to actually train us in Vedic culture and in ways that were somewhat human. <laughs> and some of the devotees that came to Prabhupada, like there was one devotee, I didn't mention his name, he had him bathe in one month. He didn't have, he didn't change clothes, he didn't know. <laughs> so he came into the temple, and that changed the whole atmosphere. <laughs> it was like, whoa, don't take your shoes off the face. <laughs> So, so this was what it like in the old days when people were coming in for bathing. That's for old people, not us. But why one, one devotee he he took him and threw him in the shower and <laughs> rubbed him down. It took a long time to get him close to clean. <laughs> there were a few other living entities that were associated with him. <laughs> So, you know, he was just one of a few others that were like that. This is what Prabhupada And then one time he was in Los Angeles and Prabhupada was having a kirtan for some people there were just getting high. One girl took off all her clothes and started dancing. Prabhupada looked at her. And then Malati ran and threw a cloth at her. So, you know, starting Krishna consciousness in, in, in America, especially on the two coasts, the east and the west coast, let's say, really, Prabhupada was thinking, wow. And, you know, he knew, he heard of the term hippie, so someone asked Prabhupada, what is a hippie? And Prabhupada said, you know better than I. <laughs> then another time, someone asked Prabhupada, well, what is a hippie? Not part of the eight million four hundred species. <laughs> <laughs> so Prabhupada said, "Hippie, something very extraordinary." <laughs> <laughs> so he said, "But I made hippies into happies. <laughs> I made I, I actually transformed them." And sometimes, Prabhupada, someone would ask Prabhupada, "What is your mystic power?" He would point to his divine. These are my mystic powers. You know, they were, you know, sex bonders, illicit activities, intoxication, you name it. And now they're chanting Hare Krishna. They follow all principles of civility. They don't do any of those things anymore. Oh, but that's my mystic power. You think about it, it's not an exaggeration. You know, you know, a lot of times the other yogis, when they would come, they would say, you don't have to change your life. All you have to do is add the mantras and the meditation. But Prabhupada wasn't like that. Prabhupada said, no, these things that you're doing are actually contrary to your good, your best interest. They will cause you to become more and more wicked. So Prabhupada made rules and regulations. And sometimes devotees didn't like 
but the thing is, they liked Dr. Park. That was the thing. This person was really, really amazing. A lot of times they couldn't understand. I remember when I used to, when I was first joined in 1973, I was going to the Brooklyn Temple, and I was listening to Srila Prabhupada's lectures. It became very difficult for me to really understand what Prabhupada was saying. His British accent mixed with his Bengali <laughs> accent <laughs> and his English was, you know, you really had to take time to really hear for a long time before you could sort it out. And a lot of devotees found that to be true. It was hard to understand Prabhupada, but after a while it became, became normal. But probably, so the point I'm trying to make is what the difficulties that Prabhupada had to go through. And Prabhupada was not an ordinary person. He was a person from the spiritual world. But he was like the mother, he was like the father, he was like the protector, the provider. For all his new bhaktas who were coming off the streets and had no aim in life, they somehow liked Prabhupada. That, that was the thing. They thought he was really interesting and really likable. That's what they did. Prabhupada was so, a person that they, he just attracted you, even, even if you didn't understand him. He was so attractive because he was a devotee of the Lord. Now, one little the antidote story where Mukunda was Mukunda. He writes that about it in his book, 26 Second Act. He was riding with Srila Prabhupada in the car. They were sitting together. And um, um, Prabhupada, someone gave Prabhupada a nice date. And Prabhupada took the date and bit it. And he handed it to Mukunda. Now, Bakunda wasn't ready for that. <laughs> so he's thinking, he just ate on it and handed it to me. <laughs> so then he thought, well, maybe this is the right thing. So then he bit on it and gave it back to the Pope. <laughs> and Pope was said, that, that, that's all right. <laughs> This is what Prabhupada was like. <laughs> Not even women. And when he was running his program in 26 Second Avenue, he was having uh, Bhagavad Gita classes three nights a week. And then he would also prepare prasad. And uh, so Prabhupada would cook, and the people would come, he would give class, and then he would serve out prasad. And everyone would just leave after Prabhupada. Was over, Prabhupada would come and clean up whatever was there and take it back and wash over. He did everything. He cooked, served, he cleaned. He was doing everything just and also giving a lecture. So one day or one evening when Prabhupada had a program, and it was over, two boys they stayed, stayed back and they came to Prabhupada and said, Can we help you clean up while we do? And Prabhupada said, oh, I was hoping someone would ask. <laughs> Prabhupada never asked. You know, he, didn't, he wanted to somehow or other make them feel like, you know, he, wanted, he didn't want to give them any services. He wanted them just to learn about Krishna consciousness. But when they asked for service, he was giving them. That's what's going to be done. Coming to the Western country, learning the Western ways was very difficult for Prabhupada. So one night when he was in his one room, when he was living in New York, there was a big snowstorm. And he, when he looked out the window, he thought somebody had painted the building next to it. <laughs> and he realized that it was snowing. And Prabhupada, you know, he carried a lot of with his, his traditional Indian ways of doing things. One day he went to uh, one little market to buy some items, you know, a few items for eating and other things. So they had a little basket and he rolled it down. So he put the items in the basket, came up to the cashier. 
And the cash here checked all the items and she said that'll be eleven dollars and fifty five cents. I'm told by said to her, I'll give you five dollars. <laughs> He said, um, excuse me, sir, it's 11 He said, it's not worth it. <laughs> so you, you understand the, the mood, right? This is the Indian way. You can it. And the prof, I wasn't going to change. He was in there. So she thought, but somehow or other, she thought this man is quite nice. So she took prof as five dollars and paid the rent herself. And later she told the devotee, the devotee said, found out about the situation. And he was such a nice person. I just gave him. That was Prabhupada. When he was in Sally Agarwar's house, when Prabhupada saw him, it was a bathtub, but Prabhupada didn't like bathtubs. So he used to fill the water in the bathtub and stand outside. <laughs> <laughs> And then Sally was wondering why all the water was coming out underneath the door of wedding or living room. And banging on the door, Swamiji, what's going on? Baba <laughs> never believed in standing in your own. You know, that's just for pooping, you know. <laughs> so this is you know, some of the strangeness of the West. <laughs> that Prabhupada had to somehow or other deal with. But Prabhupada had a mission, he was fixed on his mission, despite all the difficulties. Of course, we know the difficulties he undergone with the, him over on the boat, which was very difficult. You know, 39, 38 days on the ocean. Have you ever been on a boat yeah. for a long period of time? Oh my God, that's miserable. How many days? No, it's called seasick. The boat was all over the place. Really? Maybe you were an assistant boat or something. <laughs> So, yeah, so Prabhupada came and uh, Prabhupada said, when the ocean is calm, there's fog, you can't see anything. And when it's not calm, it's rough, and then you get seasick. So whatever way it is, it's not pleasant. I remember Bhakti Churu Maharaj, all glories to his brother, such a great personality he was really miss his presence. He had so much to contribute to Krishna consciousness, and he did. Uh, he arranged for a program in London, it was in 2012, where it was a boat cruise. They were leave, leaving from Southampton, in, which was at the very tip in the southern part of the, the United Kingdom. I remember I was there rather than swimming. Guru Shautam Maharaj was there, Bhakti Churu Maharaj was there. We went all on it. We went from port to port in different places to inquire about. And some devotees got really seasick. But the interesting part was, you know, Radha Swami prepared us for the whole journey. When we were first coming onto the boat, we were signing up to go in and register. Because this was like an, a cruiser with, and there was 250 other people on, and we were all part of the whole gang. So we really had our section, and we were going to do our program. And uh, so Radha Swami came and he said, mm, well, Southampton, that's the same place the Titanic took off from. <laughs> so that was the introduction. <laughs> but that wasn't the whole thing. And he said, this particular ship has a sister ship that a year ago crashed <laughs> in Italy. 
And so after introducing us to our destiny, <laughs> he was testing us to see where we were going to go. And then we thought, well, all right, if you're going to go far, I will go too. <laughs> so he went. So I remember that, yeah, he, he, he made things a little bit less exciting. <laughs> <laughs> This is, uh, yeah, and so we went from port to port to go these kind of things. In fact, some of the only thing I can add is that stop in one port and take an airplane back to Bunger. And because at the last day, I remember the boat was going, I was thinking, yeah, pretty soon I'm going to be one of them. <laughs> you can imagine what she would have felt on that to go through 38 days on the ocean. And there was no room, there's no place to stop or cross. So after you know enduring two heart attacks during that time, in fact, the second heart attack was so severe that Prabhupada that night he was laying and he had a vision. It was actually they say a dream or a vision. And in that vision, Krishna appeared to him in his many incarnations. And the the image was that Krishna was rowing the boat to be Prabhupada Shiva and said, I'm taking care of you, don't worry. So Prabhupada got assurance from Krishna because Prabhupada was on the verge of leaving his body on that ship. And again in 1967, again, when uh, he got sick for his third time, he had his third heart attack. The doctor said that that was the time he was meant to leave. So Prabhupada said, I pray to Krishna, my mission is not finished. Please give me more time to establish my mission. Krishna, and later on, Prabhupada said after, Krishna gave me 10 more years. And then from 1967, of course, Prabhupada left in 1977. And so, and then in those 10 years, Prabhupada really pushed his way. I mean, book distribution, Hari Nams, and opening temples, initiating devotees, and traveling all over the world, translating books, writing books, distributing. Prabhupada, it was like a bonanza. It was like an inundation of Krishna consciousness that hit the world. From basically from 1970 to 1976, those years were so powerful. In fact, even one senator in the United States, he said, if this Krishna consciousness continues to grow the way it is, it will take over the United States. And it was so powerful. The roads were being made every day. You were there. You were in the midst of all that. You were proud by bodyguards for a while, right? <laughs> he was the one that interrupted the Australian Chicago. Oh, oh, that's not it. Was sitting right next to Prabhupada on the ocean, the whole way. And that was your service, right? Yeah. 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 Prabhupada needed a bodyguard. He said he was, in those days, people were quite wild and kind of crazy. But yeah. The Philadelphia Rathi Archer, there was one man, big, huge guy. And Prabhupada was trying to give a speech, and this man was just screaming all kinds of strange mantras. And, he was just, <laughs> and you could hear him yelling in the background, and all of a sudden you hear. <laughs> what happened was he was standing next to a fountain. And one devotee didn't want didn't want to tolerate it. it Bonnie Knight Boston, remember Bonnie Knight Boston? Yeah. Yeah. He came charging at that guy at full speed and hit him and knocked him into this pool of water. <laughs> <laughs> and everything became nice. <laughs> <laughs> so something they don't mess with the Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> One time, Prabhupada was just walking. He had just got out of the airport. He was walking with a group of his devotees on the outside, walking fast, and just heading right towards Prabhupada. He was going to smash into him. 
But Hari Kesh Maharaj, just at the last minute, saw the man and deflected it off. And he would have hit Prabhupada. That would have been. So Prabhupada had a lot of close calls. So it's not like his mission was just like all roses. <laughs> Prabhupada had to really, really undergo so much difficulty along with trying to educate and deal with, you know, even the, the secular society of trying to influence. He can imagine the, what he had to go through, especially at the age of 70. How many of you are? You must be, yeah, I'm, 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 you're close. I'm, I'm over. <laughs> yeah, yesterday's your birthday. Yeah, Wednesday, yeah. right? Yeah, today I'm 48 years old. <laughs> yeah, no, that is, well, yeah, yeah, I joined in 1973, so yeah, I'm 21. Before then, I was. I was <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's just like this is the way it was. So, Prabhupada had to the, and the, endure so many. But one of my favorite pastimes, which really illustrates what is bhakti yoga about. If you can understand this pastime in, in depth, then you will understand what it's about. <laughs> Prabhupada would travel from place to place and he would have his devotees with him. And uh, when he would get off the plane, the devotees would be there in the airport. You probably saw that many times where they would come and they would just take over the airport <laughs> and just have kirtan and everybody in the airport with him. Because in, in those days, the airport was open. You know, you know you, anybody could go in and do whatever they wanted. It wasn't considered to be private. They changed the laws that because of us. <laughs> really, they did. I think it's because of us. And, uh, and so Prabhupada would come off the plane and the devotees would go wild. <laughs> so one particular incident when Prabhupada was complaining with Sri Tikirti Prabhu, they were walking off. As soon as the devotees saw them, they burst into mad kirtan. But along with that, there was a lot of the emotional outbreak. Devotees, when they saw Prabhupada, many of them were crying, some were rolling on the ground, and it was just like an emotional roller coaster for many. And Prabhupada was just smiling, you know. And Prabhupada went back to his quarters. He said to Kirti, he's looking at this whole thing, and he said, Wow, these devotees have so much love for Prabhupada. So that morning, the next morning, actually, he was massaging Prabhupada. And he has to ask the question. He says, Father, uh, now, Prabhupada, your, your disciples, they have so much love for you. But I don't feel like that. And he, uh, he wanted an answer. <laughs> Prabhupada didn't say anything. He remained completely quiet. Kasuti Kirti continued on for his massage. He felt like went for his afternoon bath, and then he came and Shuti Kirti arranged for him his prashad on the top. And Prabhupada sat down to take prashad. Prabhupada would generally eat prashad by himself, unless there were some special, special guests. I was in Los Angeles Temple, and they showed me the place where Prabhupada used to sit and take prashad. It would be a little table facing the corner of the wall. He would just wouldn't see anybody because Prabhupada's mood was Krishna has come in the form of Prashadam, therefore we should honor Krishna. So Prabhupada would like to simply absorb himself in honoring Krishna. So when his servant would bring him in, and Prabhupada would have a bell. And then when he was ready, he would ring the bell and the servant would come. So Sruti Kirti comes in after Prabhupada, rings the bell, he pays his obeisance, he gets up. Prabhupada looks at him and says, You like your service? And Sruti Kirti Prabhu said, Oh, yes, Prabhupada, very much. Prabhupada said, That is love. <laughs> He said, anyone can jump up and down, honey bowl. <laughs> Above means to serve. 
love means because when you when you really want to please someone, you want to do something. And if you have that attraction, then you want to do it more and more and more. And then your life becomes serving that object of your devotion. In this case, Sri Prabhupada and Krishna. We see that even in the material world when someone becomes attached to someone very strongly, they always want to do something for them or please them or be with them. So Prabhupada taught us, yes, bhakti means to serve. Bhakti means to serve. So that's a really significant point of our philosophical understanding because Prabhupada's, all of Prabhupada's books, Prabhupada was asked, what is the essence of your books? The essence of Prabhupada would say, the essence of my books, he said in two different answers, he said, is to understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God who he is. He said, that's the, and another time he said, the essence of all my books is to share my Krishna. So he answered in two different ways. But it's they're both the, pretty much the same answer. So this is a little bit about how Prabhupada would teach in different ways. There's another nice story. This is a little interesting. You probably heard of this story. Uh, Prabhupada was in uh, Mexico. He was on his way to Venezuela. So he had just left the temple. He was with Sri Kirti Gadana. He was with Paramahansa Maharaj. So the three of them were traveling together. So the problem, the problem I was getting into this car, one lady, she came with a pack, a little aluminum foil, and she said, Prashad. So Prabhupada took it, gave it to Shukti Kirti, they got on the plane. Prabhupada always liked to sit by the window. <laughs> he liked to look out the window, and he was always fascinated to <laughs> looking out the window. And so Shruti Kirti Prabhu would sit in the middle and Paramahansa was sitting on the end. So Prabhupada was in Prashad. Okay. So he took out the, the aluminum foil, he puts it on Prabhupada's table, and Prabhupada opens it up, and it's puff rice. Puff rice, moody. So he's eating a little bit of moody. And he passes it over to Shruti Kirti, who takes it and divides it and gives half to Paramahansa. So they're, they're eating it. And then all of a sudden, the stewardess comes along and she says, Oh, that looks very nice. And she reaches past Paramahansa and she grabs and Shruti Kirti like a handful of the puff rice and eats it. Yeah. Now, you can imagine <laughs> what, I mean, Shruti Kirti didn't know what to think. <laughs> the problem was just like, like nothing happened. <laughs> and, and so Prabhupada then turned to Shruti Kirti, asked her if she could get us some hot milk. <laughs> and then he did. And she said, Oh, yes, I'll go to business class. I can do that. She came, she came with a nice glass of hot milk for Prabhupada. And she did some nice service. So I was talking to Shruti Kirti many years ago, not too many years ago. And that's all of the story that I actually knew. That was the whole thing. But then he told me one day I was sitting, I was just talking about Prabhupada, talking about this, about three hours. And I was so tired after I finished. And I was getting off, just thinking, well, I just can't wait to get back and get some rest. And two brahmacharis walk up to me and said, Can we speak to you? I said, oh. I'm so tired. No, this is really important. All right, what do you want to say? They said we were doing books in the area of Mexico, in the outlands, in, in the more or less in the villages. And we went door to door distributing books. So I knocked on one door, and this lady opens the door. And she says, oh, Hare Krishna, come on in. So she, they come in, and her whole house is decorated with pictures of Krishna. You know, nice paraphernalia of Hare Krishna. And as the same stewardess. That was her. All she had done was take Prabhupada's remnants, and her whole life changed. She never met devotees before and never met devotees after. Only when she, um, when the devotees came, she had ordered everything 
than she had in their house. Amazing. The power of Maha Prashan, but that's not Maha. That's called Maha Maha. Yeah. Scriptures talk about that. That substance it says it's so valuable, you should do anything to get it. And you can remember some stories of devotees would steal Prabhupada's plate and hide it in the room. He did it also. I mean, nobody really condemned anybody for doing it, but they didn't like it because nobody else got it. <laughs> Eventually, the plate arrived. Yeah. Yeah. So Prabhupada's Prashan was like, and it, it says there's three very powerful spiritual substances. The water that washes the feet of the pure devotee, the dust from his lotus feet, and the Prashan coming from him. Because he takes the remnants of the Lord, and that's Maha, but then when he eats it, at least when he leaves, that's Maha Maha. That's that. Did you get that? It says, beg, borrow, and steal the bread. He said, well, he took that literally. <laughs> Think about the first Prashada, there was one story where Prabhupada, Prabhupada would have darshan at nights in a lot of places. He would speak for a while, and someone would bring this big, huge plate of mama to Prabhupada. So he would look at it and take a few bites of a few things, and then he would ask one of his servants to distribute it. So they would distribute it. And so they would go from person to person in the room. And then the devotees would point. And so Papa was watching that. So one night he decided to change the whole protocol. So he gave it to the servant. He said, You take it and you mix it all up. You can make one match. <laughs> and so, yeah, and then he said, now you distribute it. He wanted to teach it to the Prashad of the Vast to leave it. Interesting. So, the life of Srila Prabhupada spreading Krishna consciousness, I mean, we have, I mean, we have. Close to a hundred books written by devotees about their experiences. The Srila Prabhupada around the world. It's amazing what one's been documented about the life of Srila Prabhupada. Practically nothing's been left out. And Prabhupada had some mad, many difficult times. He had a head on car crash in Mauritius. 1975, he was in Mauritius. And you drive on the other side of the road. It's the left side, just like India and Karnataka. And somebody was driving it. They were, our car was on the right side of the road, on, on the proper side of the road. And some guests, they didn't know it, and they head on coming. Prabhupada could sense something was coming up. So just before the crash, Prabhupada took his cane and jammed it into the floor. He was sitting in the back. And that prevented him from being knocked forward. And, and somehow Prabhupada got a, got a scratch, got a scratch on his leg or something, something else. But, so it wasn't so easy. <laughs> Prabhupada had to go through so many difficulties in spreading Krishna consciousness. But he was never discouraged. Never discouraged. Even when I don't know if you've seen this latest book that was released. I will go to your temple. Have you seen that book? Yeah, it's it's the story of Juhu. How the devotee struggled so hard to get that. And if you read that, you can see the glories of Sri Prabhupada. How he had to fight these cheaters who were trying to cheat, take our money, and give us nothing. Sri Prabhupada was so expert in dealing with that. And now we have a grand temple that not only a grand temple, it's probably it's known all over India. And it does it does Maha Prashan distribution, but it's food prashan distribution every day to thousands and thousands of people. It's one of 
one of the most powerful, most glorious temples. And Prabhupada really had to work to get that land and build that temple up. And Prabhupada never got to see the offering, the opening, I'm sorry. Prabhupada left in November 1977 and opened in um, the 14th of January 1977. Prabhupada really struggled. If you read that, I would highly suggest this is this kind of book you can't put down. You pick it up and you just read. Uh, did you read it? You have a copy. Yeah. And it's amazing. I just finished it. So I wanted to speak a little bit about the glories of Srila Prabhupada so we can understand who this personality is that came. He came for a special mission. And this mission is Lord Chaitanya's mission. What is that mission? When someone asked Srila Prabhupada, Lord Chaitanya came. And he took Krishna consciousness throughout the entire Indian subcontinent. Lord Chaitanya spread Krishna consciousness all over India. He traveled for six years down the down the um, down the eastern side and came back up to the western side and then crossed Mumbai and Bombay and back up to Jagannath for six years. And he he established Krishna consciousness everywhere. So some devotee asked no, Prabhupada, Lord Chaitanya was here, he established Krishna consciousness in India. Why didn't he take it around the world? That was the question. Prabhupada said, he left it for me to do. <laughs> and that's Krishna. He wants to glorify his devotees. Krishna can do anything. Anything. Prabhupada, you will try to illustrate this, this quality of Krishna by saying he can change day into night and night into day. Yeah, figure that one out. <laughs> so that's Krishna. One time when Prabhupada was in uh, London, Prabhupada said, bring some important people I want to discuss, you know. <laughs> He's probably just sitting in the temple. So Shandasuni was out there. He was meeting authors and politicians. And so he came across one group called the Mensa Society. This club was a philosophical society that would take difficult philosophical principles and theories and discuss them. They were just like, kind of like a, a verminical. They would just sit and discuss philosophy. So they came to meet Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was talking about Krishna. Krishna is all powerful. He can anything. He's the Supreme Lord. He's glorifying Krishna. So one of them asked the question, well, you say that Krishna can do anything. Well, can he create a rock he can't lift? Let go. <laughs> <laughs> so if you answer yes, that means you restrict his, his lifting power. <laughs> if you say no, that restricts his creating power. So how would you how about answer it perfectly? He said, yes, Krishna can create a rock. He can't lift and then he'll lift it. <laughs> so don't try to trick the spiritual master. <laughs> that reminds me of another story. The boys were in Vrindavan. Prabhupada was also there. Prabhupada had his quarters a little bit away from the temple. He knew where they were going. Prabhupada's quarters. So he would go to the temple daily. And he had a, these pair of white shoes, a little kind of like moccasins. So he would leave them outside the door, and then he would put them on, go to the temple, come back, leave them by the door, and go in his, in his quarters. So one devotee, I don't remember his name, he was thinking, I'm going to get some shoes. <laughs> so he went shopping, he went to Rindavan and found the exact same pair, same color, same everything. I was waiting for his chance to switch. <laughs> so, you know, so Prabhupada's doing his thing. So this time he's all ready. Uh, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna wait till Prabhupada comes back and goes in his quarter. So Prabhupada comes back from the temple. Instead of putting his shoes out, he walks in the room with his shoes out. First time he did that. Everybody's thinking, he never does that. <laughs> And uh, 
then he didn't know what to do. So the next day, Papa gave class and said, don't try to play tricks on your spiritual <laughs> And then he, said, he knew who it was, too, and he came to me and he said, yes, you can have the shoe. So I gave the shoe. Prabhupada knew everything. Sometimes spirit devotees want to see what Prabhupada was doing when he was alone. So one time they looked through the keyhole of the door and they saw an eye looking back. <laughs> <laughs> You're watching me, I'm watching you. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, Prabhupada's watchful. <laughs> yeah, Prabhupada knew everything. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't fool Prabhupada. If you tried to second guess what Prabhupada was going to do next, you were always wrong. <laughs> Even if you knew his pattern, if you tried to guess it, he would change the pattern. And sometimes people will think, well, I can figure out the spiritual master. Mm -hmm. Don't try. <laughs> Don't try. So that's what she was Prabhupada. But Prabhupada was so kind and very merciful. And he left us a great legacy. He left us his books. It would take time to read his books, to discuss the books, to try to understand it deeper, to also try to understand how to apply the teachings in our life. Prabhupada gave us that great treasure of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada said, everything you want to know is in Srimad Bhagavatam. And he wasn't just using some euphemism to make us, you know, read the book. Everything is there. All subject matters you can find in Srimad Bhagavatam. And that's, that was his great gift to the world. Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada said, my books will be the law books for the next 10,000 years, which means that we can always refer to Srila Prabhupada's books. If we need any advice or understanding of anything, it's all there. And Prabhupada didn't write his purports just for, you know, the time. It, was, it can be applied to any time, all times, people. He had that vision, of how to make it relevant for, every, for everybody at all times and all times. So his books, and he wanted us to read his books. And not only read it, but understand it. And of course, also distribute his books whenever we can. Right, Acharya, when you distribute his books. He's making an effort. He goes out regularly to distribute his books. All by himself. He doesn't consider the books. He meets some interesting people. So yeah, um, book distribution is actually quite exciting. You know, many of us are interested. But if a first Prabhupada wrote in 1977, there's a letter he wrote to the German country. He said, if someone gets a book, if someone just sees a book, someone just touches a book, their life is, is changed. In other words, they, they, they receive Krishna's mercy just by seeing the book. How powerful. I remember one story where one, this was in Italy. Uh, the trains in Italy would stop for the different places. And when they would stop, the passengers would get on and off. And usually there would be a five minute delay. So the book distributors would run on the trains in Italy and then try to get as many people as they could before the train was. So one girl, she jumped out of the train and she, she approached one man. And he was quite arrogant. He didn't like the whole idea. So he grabbed the book out of her hand and he pushed her and she fell. And she fell out the train door onto the ground. And of course, the train took one more. And he kept the book, he didn't give anything. Later on, it was a little, we found out that that same man later came down with terminal cancer. 
And when he came down with terminal cancer, he started to think, I need something religious. But he went into the library looking for the Bible, and he found that same book, the Kepler. And then he started to read it. was a Gita, it was part of the Gita. He started to read it. And then everything, all the questions that he was looking for, it gave him all the answers right there. And he, uh, he completely changed. And then he went to the temple. He knocked on the door. And guess who opened the door? The same girl he pushed out the door. She was the one that opened the door to read it. He fell flat on the ground, face down, and he was crying. And he was apologizing how much he mis mistreated her. And he said, I want to become a devotee. Power of these books, you know. And all he did was get the book. He didn't even know what he even talked to him. He just stayed within his, his house. And somehow, as Prabhupada said, if anyone gets the book, in due course of time, that book will act. May not act at that particular time. So this is what Prabhupada gave us. He gave us these books, which are really the foundation of our for our direction and our happiness in Krishna consciousness. And this this particular week is Prabhupada's book. I don't know what they call it. Books have the book. Books have the basis. Books have the basis, right? But the devotees are doing seminars around the world on Prabhupada's books. I did one with uh, Krishna Shetra Maharaj and Yadavanda Swami and uh, and uh, Gaini Thai was so that was that was a few days ago. But devotees are just talking the glories of Sri Prabhupada's books. So if I have to say anything, read the books. <laughs> and because this will also please Srila Prabhupada. It will really make him happy knowing that his books are actually being read and understood by his devotees. Because he said, everything, everything I need to know is in my books. It's really my books. He was asked, how can we associate you with you? He said, I'm in my books. And that's true. He is actually personally present in his Bhakti Vedanta purports, which he said were his ecstasy and Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada's books are really we shouldn't just have a nice library and get dusted once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, it looks nice. I went to Subal's house the other day the last few times we he just had a beautiful life. I was just, I want, he wanted to serve me for shot and I wanted to look at the books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just looking around and saying that I love books. <laughs> books are everything. And Prabhupada's books are, I mean, they're more than just philosophical teachings. They're a way to, they're a way to the platform of Bhakti Vedanta. Everything is there in Prabhupada. So, Take some time and um, get a set of Srimad Bhagavatams and start a nice little group of devotees coming together discussing Srimad Bhagavatam. Three, four, five, six devotees coming together just discussing Prabhupada's books. And the mind becomes really inspired and devotion and we forget about everything else. All the problems go away. Until you stop reading. <laughs> the idea is not to stop. Okay, so I spoke a little bit tonight. Now the lecture starts. <laughs> 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 that, was, that was just a warm up. Really? <laughs> Is that an invitation? <laughs> I'm not sure I could do it. <laughs> I could. <laughs> Are you going to do it? Yeah.
but I'm sure as one great philosopher in our society would say, we have to have prashadam. <laughs> we cannot live by philosophy alone. <laughs> We need that for shot and that's the other part. So thank you all for coming. I'm really happy to see all of you here. I wasn't expecting it. I was thinking I was gonna go upstairs and go to sleep. <laughs> this is uh Nitai Nataraj program. <laughs> but I'm so happy to see everyone. So thank you for coming and hearing about Shiva Prabhupada because that's the best thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Pram, uh, pram, pram, pramata, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pramata. Uh, so many times when we hear about all the restaurants, we know that you know what they were in this particular world, that you know, right. Rupa and so on right. and so forth. Right. I have never come across. What's the problem? Yeah. When Prabhupada was asked, he was asked by Vishaka. Darabar's wife said, who, what, who are you in the spiritual world prophecy? That you do not require. That was the exact answer. And that was the end of that. And then someone else asked again, and Prabhupada said, if I told you, you would faint. <laughs> you would faint. You would lose, lose consciousness. So obviously, Prabhupada was an intimate with this. And Prabhupada did indicate a little bit about some people say he was with him, but where you're asked, others say he was in Sakya. And Prabhupada did say a few times that happiness is the look in Krishna's lunch bag and they all see what he would uh, <laughs> you know, well, the Asoda cooked for Krishna that day. He did say that. So, yes, there's a, there is a book. Written by one of my one of my dad's books called Babru. Babru. He goes through all of the arguments about Prabhupada's identity. He doesn't come to any conclusions because really Prabhupada never said that. Because if you he didn't want us to know that for two reasons. One is that you'll see him differently. He, he, he's in the role of our eternal spiritual master. And to keep that mood, that reverence, that respect, it's important. And the other one is that generally it's a principle you don't reveal your internal mood. That's even if you know your own internal mood, the great seasons between you and your spiritual master. To reveal it means to lose it. I had a similar incident when I was preaching. This, I think, maybe Subal remembers. Okay, you were there at the time when I was doing classes in New Jersey many years ago. There was this nice Indian coming. She was young. And she would say, I had dreams about Shiva Prabhupada. I don't know if you remember her. But she, during the question and answer, sessions, he would get up and say, I dreamt about Srila Prabhupada. And then I would think, oh, not really something to discuss in public. So I would kind of deflect the question. And then the second time that happened, again, in your place. And then I told her later on, I said, when you speak that, you lose that mercy. But she didn't take what I said seriously, at least at the time. And about a, about a year later, after I had met her, we were, I was traveling and she was traveling. We met in one airport, it was in London. And she came up to me and she said, you know, Maharaj, you're all right. Ever since I spoke then, Prabhupada's not coming in my dreams. And she was definitely getting Prabhupada. That was true. I could see it was is telling the truth, but it's not something that it's meant to be revealed. So Prabhupada also understood that that's something that is between you and Krishna, or you and your spiritual master. Like that. And you know that 
only on a higher level of bhakti. It's not something you can speculate and think, well, well, my name is Brajya Vilasini, so I must be an energy of Radharani. <laughs> Maybe I'm Radharani. <laughs> so we, we, get, we get a name like, I think my name means Lord Shiva, so I think maybe I'm Lord Shiva. Or maybe one of these. Oh, I am a follower of Lord Shiva. Because Lord Shiva's followers are, what are they? They're the ghosts. And the, and the, and the, so, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, was like this whole point is Prabhupada said when you're ready, the spiritual master will come and tell you you are is the day. Well not you're the day, but you're sort of phenomenal. Your what is it called? Huh? Siddhadeva, thank you. Yeah, your Siddhadeva. So that's something because that used to be a part of our system where at one point you would find a guru who would take you into that realm and reveal what who you are in the spiritual realm. And there's eleven eleven points to that, eleven categories of identity. Your color, your service, where you live, what it, uh, what is your dress, so many different things. But then Bhakti Siddhanta saw that people were just, you know, pretentiously adopting all these things. So he stopped the whole thing. That now that that Siddhartha initiation was removed from the Vaishnav culture, and. Uh, Prabhupada followed his Guru Maharaj, as we know, because even in our society, there was a Gopi Baba Club that came in 1970, and people were dressing up as Gopis, and peacocks, and other things. Yeah. And uh, Prabhupada, when Prabhupada heard about it, you remember he heard about it. Prabhupada heard about it, he said, stop it immediately. Stop it immediately. And then he explained when the when the disciple is ready, the guru will appear and enlighten the disciple about his uh, day. And some people can. So even if you have reached that stage and you understand, because there is a process by which you follow, you can start to understand that. that is, that's the process of Raghavita Bhakti. That's Raghavita Sama. And that's on the level of Bhakti. But um, even if you do understand, you don't speak about it. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada picked that. He had it revealed. Prabhupada knew who he was in the spiritual. That was clear. He knew he was identity. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Um, it Mm -hmm. And we were wondering uh, what made you write the book about prison industry and book distribution prison. Well, what was she looking about? Yeah, Lord Chaitanya's mood is Pratika Pavana, uh, showing mercy to the most fallen. So we learned in the life of Lord Chaitanya that he gave mercy to Jagayanara, the most criminal type of people. And he brought them to the stage of you know, pure devotional service. So our mood is Pratipatama trying to give Krishna consciousness to anyone and everyone, especially those who are downtrodden. So we can say these people are marginalized and they're forgotten. And they're also a good candidate for Krishna consciousness. So I got connected with the whole process of preaching in prison for years. That was back in 1989. And then I continued to do that for years, writing letters and visiting Krishna. Then later the book came out. And that was holy day. I was forgetting the days. 
And uh, I know the I just brought down a whole stack of uh, forbidden voices. The forbidden voices was the second edition, and that's mostly a compilation of writings from the Inuits. It's coming from them. Their poetry, their artwork, their realizations, the glorifications of Bhakti, the glorifications of Prabhupada. So all that, that's basically what the forbidden voice is. The other book, Holy Jail, that was is more, it's a more complete uh, overview of Krishna's teachings and all that. So yeah. Uh, I just got somehow connected with them, and then I started to go deeper and deeper. And I could see these people, they appreciate it. They find it hard to practice, but they definitely very much are attracted to Prabhupada's books. And there are so many stories that have changed their lives completely and even saved their lives, I believe, with people changing their lives. Their lives are actually were saved by Prabhupada's books. So our biggest effort to change them is just to flood the jail with books. Yeah, we did that. We were doing that in, in uh, London just before the lockdown came. I was I was I was waiting for years to open up London to find out that people had all these jails to give us prison programs. We were doing one after another then the whole lockdown came we had to stop. So yeah. In America is it's the biggest. London is also there, Croatia were also there, Slovenia, a few other places. Everybody's doing it around the world in different places. Yeah. Okay. Paramahansa. I don't know Paramahansa. Paramahansa. Well, you can ask why. <laughs> Where is he now? I mean, he is Why don't you ask him? <laughs> you think I know? <laughs> well, I can say one thing, which might indicate something. When Tamal Krishna goes home and all that, but is there devotees who never go back to God but stay in the material world and just preach Krishna? Yes. He said it with such enthusiasm. There are those who want to, you know, serve Krishna by bringing the conditions of the devotees. So they go to the universe, the universe, just preaching Krishna consciousness. And they're liberated souls. That condition, so or they either they, they were liberated, they were eternal associates of the Lord, or they became a liberated, and then once they became a liberated, and then, so you might say, you know, they also check in, go back to God and have say, Krishna, here's what's going on. <laughs> They come back out again. Yeah, there are there are souls who who simply want to spread Krishna consciousness. That's that's the eternal service of Krishna. Okay, is there anybody else for any questions? I don't know. I think it's getting a little on in time. Uh, it's almost nine o'clock. So we'll just stop here and maybe we'll have a little care time and then we'll have some push out. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. I need some advice. Yes. Another endowment. Uh, <laughs> 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 
yes, they think I like only orange. <laughs> You know, they even have an orange face mask. <laughs> that reminds me of another story that I have not done. <laughs> Did I tell it? It's a, it's a, I was in London during that Boston. In London, they're talking to Alpha Canada, they really had to talk to me. Did you see the cakes they made this year? All of Krishna's pastimes on the cake on the top. I mean, it's beautiful. Like a painting. They did it with mousy ones. Mousy perfect. Almonds. Almonds and sugar. And so on. Anyway, I was there and I was looking at the altar and I was seeing they had all these cowherd boys on. And they were dressed in different colors. And I was looking, this is one year. You know, I'd like to wear some of those colors. <laughs> <laughs> this is blues and reds and greens and yellows. <laughs> and then I thought, well, you know, it's not good. So it would be nice. So later on that day, I went upstairs to. And I left my shoes, I had a pair of Crocs. I left them outside. I came back down, the shoes were gone. <laughs> so I didn't have any shoes. And so the ladies in the kitchen, they came to the rescue. And they had all of these uh, Crocs in the kitchen that they used for kitchen shoes. And so they wanted, they wanted to have a pair of shoes. So they said, here, Miles, you can have one. And they were bright yellow. <laughs> Krishna's got a sense of humor. <laughs> Did you get my email? Yeah. Uh, what's what was, Can you tell me what the reply was? Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. 